I'm Anand Young, the director of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. A warm, warm welcome to all of you. And I know all of you are here because you're not interested in hearing about the Shiites next door or the World Series. <laughs> and you know that this is the marquee intellectual event of 2008. So thank you all for coming. The Jackson School is an institution dedicated to engaging minds and engaging the world. And one of the ways we do that is through international education and public service. And we're very fortunate that the, uh, that's the, that the um, Atsuhiko and Aina Goodwin Tatiuchi Foundation fits in perfectly with the mission of the Jackson School. We couldn't think of a better partner to have to have these events which focus on international affairs, particularly relating to Japan. So tonight, we want to start out by first having Mrs. Tatiuchi come up to the stage here to say, uh, give us a few remarks about this incredible foundation that has been so instrumental in the intellectual and cultural life of Seattle and the University of Washington. Any of you who are museum goers, who go to the East Asia Library, who go to the Seattle Public Library, you know that the Tatiuchis have supported all these and many, many other institutions. So we're very fortunate to have their foundation support us. Mrs. Tatiuchi? feel a little bit like I should have had Mr. Professor Yang speak for me instead. He's so well spoken. Tonight, this is sort of memories. I look out at everybody and I keep thinking I should know all of you and have been here before. But on behalf of the Tadeuchi Foundation, I want to welcome you and thank you very much for your interest in coming tonight. My association with the university goes back many years. I was an alumni. And now I am partaking in these lecture series. It's with pleasure I return to this beautiful campus for this fifth anniversary. I can't remember, help but remember former times, however, since this is the first year of, since my husband's death. He would be very happy to know you were all here to, to attend another lecture because he really wanted to establish a venue for furthering education and information between the United States and Japan. I feel his presence very keenly tonight. As you know, the primary focus of our foundation is to build bridges between the United States and Japan. And we believe the, United, the University of Washington, by enhancing this understanding in Japan-US relations, can contribute greatly to the ongoing positive relationship between these two great countries. Today, this evening's speaker represents a remarkable skill, depth, talent and experience in understanding this close and yet delicate relationship between the United States and Japan. I like to think that he would, my husband would have appreciated this Tadeuchi lecture, where we continue to break new ground and would have been highly pleased with today's selection of our speaker. I eagerly await Secretary Mineta's comments and insights for tonight. I would also like to ex express my appreciation from the foundation to President President Emmert and his staff for their support for the continuing lectures, and to the staff of the Jackson School. They have been very wonderful in putting in a lot of hard work and details for tonight. The Tadeuchi Foundation exists because of my husband's unique vision of this world, a vision we are trying to fulfill. Your presence here speaks to that vision, and we really do want to make things more of a bridge between these two great countries. We really are knowing each other so well. Thank you again for your attendance, and we hope to see you on future occasions that explore important issues in US-Japan relations. Thank you for coming. I should have mentioned that this is the fifth Tateuchi lecture. Number one was given by speaker Tom Foley, Last year's, if you recall, was given by Senator Inouye. 
And as we're celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Tatiochi Lecture, we're about to embark on the hundredth anniversary of the Jackson School. So for the coming year, we will be um, engaged in a number of events, uh, most of them public, most of them in Seattle, but also around the world. And in those celebrations, we want to particularly highlight our long-standing connection to Japan, because the school began in 1909 as an institution dedicated to the study of Japan and China, and especially Japan at the outset. So we're very fortunate to be associated with the Tatiochi Foundation and uh, their generous support, which enables us to hold these lectures. To introduce our speaker today, we have Scott Oki, known to all of us as, at UW as Regent Oki who is the Vice President and Secretary of the Oki Foundation. Scott. It is my distinct honor to uh, introduce Norm Mineta. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to do this, and uh, although he may not be so pleased after I get done with this introduction, um, Norm was born in San Jose, California. Uh, it may come as a surprise that I actually didn't have to Google him to find that out. Um, I know this because last week I actually flew into San Jose on a golf boondoggle and quickly became lost driving around the airport and all the construction. Uh, but one thing that wasn't lost on me was the fact that the airport is named after him. And anyone with an airport named after him was either born there or buried there. Norm, we're glad you're here with us this evening. <laughs> Norm attended schools in San Jose, Hart Mountain, internment camp in Wyoming, and Evanston, Illinois. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of California at Berkeley. He worked in the family insurance business and later served in the uh, US, also served in U.S. Army military intelligence. His public service career is, uh, is really quite astounding started with his appointment in 1967 to the San Jose Human Relations Commission. He went on to serve as a city councilman, vice mayor, and then mayor of San Jose. He was elected as a Democrat to the 94th Congress and actually to 10 succeeding Congresses from 1975 to 1995. Uh, when he resigned on October the 10th, 1995, he was chairman of the Committee of Public Works and Transportation. He went on to serve as Secretary of Commerce in the Clinton administration and then Secretary of Transportation under George W. Bush. He now serves as Vice Chairman of Hill and Knowlton. You'll agree that all of this is pretty darned impressive, um, but for me, perhaps the thing that best characterizes Norm Minetta is the fact that he was a Boy Scout. In addition to all of the other things Norm has done, he could also very well be the poster boy for the scouting movement. No one lives the scout oath and the scout law better than Norm Mineta does. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the honorable and still Boy Scout Norman Yoshio Mineta. Scott, thank you very, very much for your very kind and generous introduction. But more importantly, I want to thank you for all the community service uh, that you continue to do. Scott has um, done very well in life, but he has taken his entrepreneurial skills and his philanthropic goals, put them together in terms of supporting community activities. And um, Scott remembers from whence he came and continues to do great work uh, in the community, for which all of us are very, very appreciative. And uh, we thank you very, very much, Scott, for all that you do. Uh, 
<coughs> to uh, Mrs. Ina Goodwin Tateuchi, uh, I want to thank you and the foundation for, again, uh, your support of the Jackson School here, the University of Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, it really is a great honor for me to be invited here to the University of Washington as the Tateuchi Distinguished Speaker for 2008. Now, sadly, Mr. Atsuhiko Tateuchi is not with us this evening, but his memory and his great contribution that the Tateuchi Foundation has made to so many organizations throughout the United States of America lives on. And I'm also honored to follow other speakers who have addressed this series in the past. My good friends, Senator Daniel Inoue of Hawaii and Speaker and Ambassador Tom Foley. Toyo Gyoten, a man who has contributed so much to Japan's international economic standing and reputation. And Lester Brown, who has rightly been called, and I quote, the guru of the global environmental movement, unquote, for his vision of an environmentally sustainable world economy. It also is an, uh, an honor for me to be here at the University of Washington, one of the <clears throat> world's leading centers of study and research on East Asia, and more relevant to tonight's discussion, Japan. So many of your scholars, starting with Ken Pyle, are known and respected around the world, as is, as is the Journal of Japanese Studies, which UW has published for over three decades. And then there's, of course, Dr. Donald Hellman, who is also going to be our moderator during the question and answer session this evening. Now, as all of you know so very well, and I know even more acutely, I am not an academic. So it is with a great deal of hesitation and much humility that I speak to you this evening about the importance of strengthening our relationship with Japan in the years ahead. But as a former politician and government official, perhaps I can take uh, what I would consider a practical approach to how we might do this. As Scott has mentioned, I served as Secretary of Commerce under President Clinton and Secretary of Transportation under President George, a., uh, George W. Bush, uh, not as Secretary of Defense or Secretary of State. So my understanding of our relationship with Japan and its still untapped potential goes beyond the realm of national security and military affairs. And as an American of Japanese ancestry, I also recognize the importance of our cultural ties and the people-to-people -people connection. Our overall goal should be just what the mission statement of the Tateuchi Foundation says, and I quote, to promote and improve understanding, knowledge, and the quality of the relations between Japan and the United States, unquote. Now, to me, that means across the board, in all areas of relationships. Many observers say today that relations between the United States and Japan have never been better. And I think they are right. But when you ask them why they think that way, they cite our security relationship, which has never been closer. They cite Japan's troop uh, presence in Iraq from 2004 to 2006, Japan's military airlift mission to Iraq, 
and the presence of Japanese naval vessels in the Indian Ocean to support the counter-terrorist effort in Afghanistan. But when people say that the state of our relationship has never been better, most observers do not cite our cooperation on global affairs or how we are co cooperating on the environment or energy or world health. They don't talk about what we are doing to take our bilateral economic relationship to the next level or what we are doing together to support economic development in the world's poorest nations. They don't talk about the decline in our cultural and intellectual exchanges or the decreasing number of Japanese and American students who study in each other's countries. And they don't mention the number of American think tanks who have cut back on their Japan programs and eliminated their resident Japan experts. And they don't cite how many US members of Congress, senators and governors have been bypassing Japan in their travels overseas. Well, when you live inside the Beltway as I do, it is easy to think that the relationship between any two countries is what the, <clears throat> their governments do with each other. But the government to government relationship is just one part of the US-Japan relationship. Because we are both democracies, because we are the number one and the number two economies in the world, because we are both cultural and technological powerhouses, we cannot leave out the people. Government is just the tip of the iceberg. It is the American and the Japanese people who are the real base of this relationship, and it is that base that we need to rebuild in the months and the years ahead. As all of you are very well aware, we are now just eight days away from our elections. And I have heard some Japanese say that they are disappointed that Japan has not been mentioned by either of the candidates. And this is another indication of Japan passing. Actually, I have not heard either of the candidates talk about Britain or Germany, Italy, France, Canada, either. So I do not see the non-mention of Japan during the election campaign as something bad. Indeed, I remember in years past when Japan figured quite prominently in political rhetoric during election time, and it was not in a good way. So I am glad that the days of Japan bashing are behind us. Now, the good news is that both candidates, Senator McCain and Senator Obama, understand the importance of our relationship with Japan. Our concern, therefore, should be what their administration and what the Congress will do after Inauguration Day to strengthen our relationship across the board, not just in the military sphere, but also in our cooperation on foreign policy and transnational issues in business and in economics, in science cooperation, technology, and innovation, and in our cultural and people-to-people -people connections. And this means not just at the bilateral level, but also how our two great countries can work together with others on a global scale. With apologies to Ken Pyle, the other day another of America's great 
and Japan experts, Professor Jerry Curtis of Columbus, Columbia, came to Washington, D.C. to talk about the political situation in Japan. And there were a lot of veteran Japan hands in the room. And at one moment, Professor Curtis said something that really hit many in the room. He repeated Mike Mansfield, his famous line about our relationship, quote, the most important bilateral relationship in the world, bar none, unquote. And then Professor Curtis asked, how many, one, how many of us would agree with that characterization today? And there was silence in the room. During earlier administrations, both Japanese and American leaders talked about building a global partnership. But we have not heard those words in recent years. So we should ask the question anew, do we want to build a global relationship, a global partnership with Japan? To me, the answer is a very clear and unequivocal yes. Working together and with others, the United States and Japan have the capability to be a powerful force for good in the world. But we should also ask the question in Japan, do the Japanese people want to build a new global partnership with the United States? Many Japanese commentators have expressed their concern that Japan is losing its place on the world stage because the Japanese people have become too inward looking. For example, the chairman of the Kansai Economic Federation said earlier this year, and I quote, Japan's contributions have been insufficient and the country's international visibility is declining, end of quote. A recent Washington Post article said that the number of young Japanese who travel overseas has fallen in this decade because they are less adventuresome and feel more comfortable at home. A recent binational report issued by the United States-Japan Conference on Cultural and Educational Interchange, also known as CULCON, said, and I quote, Japanese intellectuals and thought leaders have been less visible in the great debates of the age than they were in more dynamic economic times. Japanese students are less ambitious than they once were about studying abroad, even as the numbers of Chinese, Indian, and Korean students in American universities are skyrocketing upward. Japan remains one of the most respected countries in the world, according to an annual polling done by the British Broadcasting Corporation and others. Yet the Japanese ability to shape the international agenda seems to be flagging, giving rise to the concern about its declining profile in the world." Unquote. Now, I quote from this report by Culcon because it is a concern that is being raised by many thoughtful Japanese. It is a trend that I believe needs to be reversed. The world welcomes and the world needs a greater Japanese contribution. And regardless of who takes office, the oath of office, as president uh, next January, what advice do I have for him? How can we strengthen and rebuild our relationship in the years ahead? First, the leadership in both Tokyo and Washington need to recommit our nations to a stronger relationship, 
not only through words, but through actions. And they need to spend the time necessary to make this happen. At the same time, we should not overemphasize the importance of personal relations at the top. Yes, the personal touch matters because it builds confidence, trust, and understanding in each other. President Reagan, during his term of office, also had the pleasure of a prime minister, Prime Minister Nakasone, who was in office for five years. President George W. Bush uh, had the relationship with some, for some three and a half years with Prime Minister Koizumi. Now, conversely, the reason I say do not over uh, rely on the personal connection is because of the reality of politics. In the past 20 years, the United States has had three presidents and we are about to get our fourth. And in that same time frame, Japan has had 14 prime ministers. In his eight years as president, Bill Clinton sat across the table from seven prime ministers. Now, during those same 20 years, uh, Japan had 19 foreign ministers. And then within the last year, President George W. Bush has had uh, three or four prime ministers. Now, whenever uh, turnover takes place that frequently, it is difficult to build a relationship from the top down. So as a practical matter, this is a relationship that has to be understood and supported at all levels in our government, from the ambassadors to the third secretaries in the American and Japanese embassies, and from cabinet secretaries to desk officers in our ministries and our departments. Everyone needs to uh, understand the importance of this relationship and act on it. They need to persuade others as well, whether they sit in the parliament or the Congress or whether they are ordinary citizens. Now, secondly, we need to recognize that our relationship is not just a military one. Our security alliance is critical to both countries and the fight against terrorism matters to all of us. But we must also ensure that we are cooperating closely at the diplomatic level on all foreign policy issues. Indeed, I believe that the policies that the next American president pursues around the world, from China to North Korea to Iran and the Middle East, will have a major impact on Japan's interests. So we need to make sure that we are cooperating well with each other. Thirdly, because we are the number one and the number two economies in the world, we need to think seriously about how we can expand our bilateral economic partnership in the years ahead. We used to spend countless hours negotiating with each other, not always happily, about trade and investment barriers, but thank goodness those days are gone. Today, both of our economies are facing difficulties, so it will be hard to take action now. But that should not prevent us from talking about the possibilities for action a year or two down the road to create an even closer economic partnership. And in the meantime, it is essential that our two countries continue to work uh, closely together to deal with the current global financial crisis. Japan, because of its own experiences in the 1990s, 
and because of its large financial reserves, can play a critical role. Fourthly, we should identify special areas for cooperation where the United States and Japan can work together with others for the good of our two countries and the world. My own candidates for closer cooperation are energy, environment, and health care, healthcare, including the issues related to our aging societies. Fifthly, we should not neglect the human dimension of our relationship, our educational and cultural ties. Earlier, I cited the Culcon report. It said that in order to ensure the future of our relationship, one of the most important tasks is to foster interest about Japan among young Americans, with interest about the United States a young, about, uh, or through young uh, Japanese, through programs that focus on language, cross-cultural understanding, and grassroots exchange. Now is the time to think about creating not only the next gener generation of American hands and, uh, and Japan uh, experts, but also informed citizens in both countries, no matter what their occupation, who understand each other's country and culture and our importance to each other. Now these days, many Japanese say that Japan is being neglected by the United States and that this is a time of Japan passing. But to my friends in Japan, I must say that I disagree. True political and economic interest in Japan may not be as high as it was in the past. But as I mentioned earlier, I don't hear many Americans talking about England, France, or, Japan, or Germany either. But, in, but interest in Japan as a country and as a culture has never been higher. Let me give you two examples from Washington, D.C. And I'm sure that you have similar examples <clears throat> here in the state of Washington. Last April, the Sakura Matsuri, Japanese cultural festival that is held on Pennsylvania Avenue during the National Cherry Blossom Festival, drew over 140,000 visitors in just seven hours. The other example is the number of young Americans who are studying Japanese. Last March, I met with many of them at the National Japan Bowl, which is a competition for high school students who are studying Japanese. <clears throat> and presently, there are 58,000 American high school students learning Japanese today, and that is really impressive. Japan, and to everyone in both countries who care about the U.S.-Japan relationship, I say that we have a real opportunity. Today we have a chance to build a new relationship for the future and for a new generation of Americans and Japanese. We have the opportunity, indeed the obligation, to create a new partnership that reaches beyond Asia and deals with issues that affect everyone on this planet. Economic growth and development, environment, energy, health, education, terrorism. And the list is endless, and so are the possibilities. So let me take Mike Mansfield's statement and update it. Quote, this can once again 
become the most important bilateral relationship in the world, bar none. End of quote. Thank you very much. For all of us teachers in the room, that was the epitome of an excellently constructed and informative lecture, beautifully delivered. Thank you very much for this. <clears throat> for this next part, Secretary Mineta becomes Professor Mineta. We become his students. And to help facilitate this conversation, the eminent professor, Don Hellman, my colleague from the Jackson School, will help facilitate the conversation. Professors Mineta and Hellman. Again, you do us all proud and embarrass us by the clarity, order, and expressiveness with which you delivered your remarks. And I was particularly taken by the, uh, the emphasis you gave to uh, the non-governmental components of, uh, of the relationship. Uh, much of the hand-wringing that goes on in Japan, as well as inside the Beltway, uh, springs from this failure to understand uh, that we really are operating in a new world and a new agenda uh, in which issues such as security, uh, in the old Mike Mansfield sense, are no longer military but involve energy and uh, uh, global health, and so <clears> forth. <throat> now, uh, with that, uh, the, the questions come up. But I, I, I want to make sure that the audience shares uh, this wonderful story that you told uh, to our dinner uh, last night about a baseball bat. I was under orders from the dean to do this. Uh, you don't know that. <clears throat> and um, uh, and I, I think. First, you should, you should tell the story, and then I do have a specific question, which I think bears very uh, strongly on the last point you were making about people to people. But please, why don't you entertain uh, with that wonderful story? <clears throat> well, in um, 1942, as a result of President Roosevelt signing Executive Order 9066, delegating to the Western Military Defense uh, Commander the ability to evacuate persons. Uh, the Commanding General, uh, General DeWitt, used that order to evacuate and in, in turn those of Japanese ancestry for the duration of World War II. So on May 29, 1942, the day that we were boarding the trains in San Jose, to go off to Santa Anita, the racetrack in Southern California. I had my Cub Scout uniform on, baseball, baseball glove, and baseball bat. And as I got on the train, the MPs confiscated my bat on the basis it could be used as a lethal weapon. Well, <clears throat> in 1991, I authored the first rewrite of the National Defense Highway Act uh, the one that President Eisenhower signed into law in 1956, totally revamping our national transportation laws relating to highways and mass transit and safety programs. And then in 1993, the American Society of Civil Engineers conferred on me uh, a Lifetime Distinguished Service Award and also presented me with um, a honorary fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And a fellow wrote to me saying, congratulations on receiving this uh, distinguished lifetime award and being a fellow, honorary fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And I was very moved by the story of your life including the fact that you lost your bat when you were being carted off to camp. And that bat's probably been replaced many times over, but I want to share with you a bat from my own collection. So I opened up this long box and 
There's a baseball bat signed by Hank Aaron, the U.S. home run king, and Sadaharu O, oh, the home run king of Japan. So I write this fellow a letter profusely thanking him for this wonderful gift. And then a reporter from the San Jose Mercury News heard about my getting this gift, and so he wrote about it. <clears throat> Being an enterprising reporter, went to a sports memorabilia shop, found out the bat was worth $1,500. Well, that was above the $250 gift limitation that members of Congress were under. So I had to pack up the bat and send it back to the fellow, thanking him for the gift. But unfortunately, I can't accept it because it's above the $250 gift limitation. And I took that letter and I wrote in the upper right-hand corner and sent it to the reporter and said, the damn government's taking my bat again. <laughs> Well, in 1995, when I retired from Congress, he wrote and said, congratulations on your retiring for con from Congress. I still want you to have the bat. And he sent it back to me. <laughs> so that bat is now hanging on my office wall. And now my question, which is an echo of what I have already received from someone in the audience. In light of your Aaron O bat story. Many say Ichiro has done more for U.S.-Japan relations on the people-to-people -people level than any set of government initiatives. Your opinion? There's no question that <clears throat> the whole uh, entry of, um, of uh, baseball players from Japan into Major League Baseball in the United States has had a very big and positive impact. And, uh, and these are the kind of relationships that do b build uh, the continuing kind of uh, <clears throat> efforts that we have to continue uh, doing in order to build a better relationship. And it's also uh, U.S. managers who go to Japan. Uh, when you look at the number of Japanese teams that have uh, <clears throat> U.S. managers now, it's it's also interesting that uh, the Japanese are seeing uh, not so much of the ball players coming on over, although there are a number over there, but it's also uh, U.S. Uh, citizens who are there managing uh, Japanese teams. All right. <clears throat> uh, there seems to be uh, 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 at least clusters of, of uh, topics of interest. Uh, let me just pick two of a contemporary sort and start with them. One is uh, the coming presidential election, and the second is, of course, uh, the ongoing financial debacle uh, that has uh, been globalized. And um, Prime Minister Aso was holding forth uh, this morning, actually, about uh, Japan's role in the world. And so I wonder if you could comment uh, very briefly, because we have many other questions, on uh, does it make any difference whether it's Obama or McCain? And secondly, what should, uh, what should or, or can Japan do uh, as a kind of a start of a new kind of leadership in the world uh, to deal with this financial crisis? Is this a target of opportunity or is it just a impending disaster? Next question. <laughs> you, you have three minutes to answer. <laughs> well, yeah. the, um, <clears throat> there's no question in my mind, because behind here, I, I was going to expose it, but I won't now, but, is my Obama pin. But uh, um, because this is an impartial panel. Uh, um, no, I, I think that <clears throat> in terms of our uh, US-Japan relationship, um, Senator McCain as an individual or Senator Obama as an individual, I'm not sure that, that, that there would be that much difference in terms of a U.S.-Japan uh, relationship approach uh, by them. And, uh, but I think the other aspect of it that you talk about, in terms of the financial relationship and the what is it that can be done, uh, 
Japan has been in, in, in this issue or this problem uh, longer than we have. They've been trying to, to deal with uh, their banking reforms, other financial reforms, uh, which they haven't been able to really deal with. And uh, <clears throat> until, and Prime Minister Koizumi was going that way, but never got the job done in terms of financial reform. But it's something that Japan is still going to have to, <clears throat> excuse me, undertake on their own. <clears throat> and as you've indicated, this is not just a U.S. financial debacle. You see what's happening in Europe. Uh, and uh, so it is something that is worldwide. And we're going to have to make sure that the slide is caught at some point to try to bring this thing around and start getting it uh, moving and trying to even stabilize it. It's probably still going to take us uh, internationally, maybe about two to three years. Uh, all the conversations are not about <clears throat> uh, this having bottomed out at this point. And so when you think about any kind of recovery, uh, we're probably uh, minimum talking four to five years. The question is, how, when do we see this whole thing uh, uh, bottoming out? And that's something that the U.S., Japan, and, uh, and other countries are just going to have to be uh, vitally involved in. Uh, let's briefly touch on another generic question. Uh, when you spoke of Japan being bypassed, uh, most people take that to mean flying over Tokyo to go to Beijing. And the question really is, there is growing consensus, for good or ill, that a China-led Asia will become the center or a center of the global political economy. Now, even in spite of the troubled historical relationship between Japan and China, vestiges of which still persist, of course. Uh, China has replaced the United States as uh, the largest, largest trading partner uh, of Japan. And Japan has increasingly uh, looked, at least major sectors of Japan, have looked de facto to Asia, not to America. And, and so may, I guess the question is, and several people have thrown in India as well. As the power shift occurs in the world, as the United States no longer is kind of the center of the global political economy, um, will Japan become more Asian? Or how will they balance the strong and close relationship nurtured for over half a century with the United States with what may well be their biggest investment and trading uh, partnership, which would be with Asia. You have two minutes to answer. <laughs> Dean, can you help me out? <laughs> <clears throat> well, first of all, um, when you look at it from, a, I think, and there's so many more experts as I look around this room that I am afraid to really dip my toes into this area. But it seems to me that the United States is going to be looking at several things. First of all, no matter the growth of the economic strength of China, including India, my feeling is that a strong U.S.-Asia-Pacific relationship is still going to be based on a strong U.S.-Japan relationship. And I feel it comes about for a couple of reasons. First of all, Japan is a democracy. China is not. India is. There, and, and I think the, and because of that, the, the, the issue of democracy 
I think there's also the question of who do we trust? And I think there's much more trust by the United States in Japan to anchor a US-Asia Pacific relationship than there would be with China or even with India. Um, and so um, <clears throat> to me, um, as China grows in, in uh, economic strength, uh, and I don't think they get there, you know, this being 2008, I, I still don't think they get there um, much before somewhere between 2015, 2020. But again, even with that strong economic relationship, to me, the trust between the United States and Japan will supplant whatever the economic strength might be between the United States and China. Um, I don't think we still really trust China. And so uh, I think Japan, in a way, when I think about this, also has to get over their inferiority complex mm -hmm. about the future. Mm -hmm. And they ought not to be just thinking about it in terms of the GDP and <clears throat> GDP relationship mm -hmm. between China and India, I mean China and the United States, or India and the United States, but that there are other kinds of important values that we get and that they get from a US-Japan relationship. And it may not just be uh, the trade dollars back and forth or uh, other relationships. And again, looking at it from this observer's very <clears throat> off the top of the head reaction, um, I really think it, uh, the U.S. relationship in Asia Pacific is still going to be based on a strong U.S.-Japan relationship and that we also have to bolster our friend Japan to not just talk themselves into a, into a hole because of the growth and the economic strength of others. You know, one supplement, uh, supplementary question by myself about that. One consequence of the uh, economic crisis has been um, a series of suggestions from Europe uh, and now from the White House about holding a new Bretton Woods, or, which is a shorthand for saying that the institutions that are currently in place, uh, more specifically, of course, financial institutions, but more generally, the United Nations. I mean, uh, for, for many years, Japan's position on the other. There's a question here but about- now they're, a, now they're a member of the National Security Council. That's right. That's and so they ought not to sit there and cower and say, oh, we're still a small little island nation. I mean, they're on, on the National Security Council as, sure, a temporary ma member, but you know they ought to be seeking a permanent uh, seat in the restructuring exactly. of the United Nations. But you see, that, that's where my question was leading, because if anything is com becoming clearer and clearer as a, con as a consequence of this financial catastrophe, is that the long postponed recognition that a new array of institutions, including the United Nations, needs to be. So instead of just trying to get a seat on the <laughs> UN, which itself is increasingly <laughs> marginalized uh, in the world, uh, maybe there's a role for Japan and the United States to, to build together uh, a new set of institutions. I mean, and this would be multilateral, but certainly Japan. Uh, and they are spending a great deal in yes. terms of foreign uh, economic development, foreign uh, investments. Yeah, they, they, they've, they've paid for more than, than the U.S. No, they've paid for more than 20% oh, yeah. of the UN budget for, for decades now, and it's very understandable they want to be on the, yeah. but it's going to have to be different. It can't be the old. I want to ask one question that is, is kind of local, yokel stuff, and then there's, there's another joint one. And that is, you're a former transportation sec, uh, secretary. You're speaking at the home, in the home of Boeing which is in a large, pretty port on the Pacific. Now, 
how will future transportation issues in the Pacific Rim affect this big port and the home of Boeing in the views of a former transportation secretary and current consultant in this field is probably your, your, your real specialty. And, and, and this, for, for my sake and everybody else's, uh, you can speak quickly and, and not technically. Uh, how, what, what do you think the issues, if any, are about transportation uh, and how would it bear on Boeing and uh, the... Well, <clears throat> one thing I think Japan has to do is to um, liberalize their um, air services agreement between the United States and Japan. I tried, uh, starting in 2002, with conversations about open skies between the United States and Japan, and that went over like a lead balloon. Uh, <clears throat> and so I never talked about open skies after that. I'd talk about liberalizing the air services agreement. But the Japanese are, are uh, they're limited by the runway at Narita, uh, and they're trying to expand uh, Haneda with some uh, international charter flights there. Um, but um, until they open up some more, as you suggested earlier, these airplanes go 8, 10, 12,000 miles. They overfly now in Japan and go directly to Singapore, Beijing, wherever they're going. And uh, I think that is, it used to be you had to stop in Tokyo to refuel to go somewhere else. But now they don't have to do that. And I think their resistance to that in the last five years or so is going to, is going to be uh, a, a price they're going to have to somehow uh, pay uh, because of the s services they're going to be losing in Japan. E even to the extent that I remember talking to uh, Minister of Transport Fuyushiba and I talked to him about liberalizing first open skies and then liberalizing and uh, he would say oh yes we would like to talk to you anytime <laughs> about uh, open skies or liberalization and I'd say, Minister Fuyushiba, your head's going the wrong way. I, I want it to go this way. And, uh, but there was a fellow by the name of uh, Mr. Ide who was in the Bureau of Aviation. And, you know, bureaucrats really control what the upper level do. And uh, so I'd say, Minister Fuyushiba, I want you to take a personal interest in the air services agreement and uh, not listen to uh, Mr. Ide all the time. I want you to take a personal interest, and I want you to call me anytime you have questions, whatever. He said, oh, yes, yes, I will. Never did. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but on the other hand, uh, Boeing does very well in Japan. Uh, they've got uh, their launch customer in, J in Japan is uh, ANA on the, um, on the uh, Dreamliner, the 787, uh, and the Japanese companies, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, others, uh, Mitsubishi are making major parts of the Dreamliner. So uh, Japan is doing very well from that perspective, but they really have to open up, I think, uh, their air lanes. And, uh, you know, it takes an hour and a half to go from Narita into Tokyo by cab. And I was trying to get the airlines to go into Nagoya and then code share with Japan Central Railroad because it's only an hour and 20 minutes on the Shinkansen from Nagoya to Tokyo. And, uh, but the Japanese government didn't want to do that because they own Haneda and uh, Narita and the Kansai airport and the Nagoya airport is a local airport authority. And they put the money together to fill in the bay, build that great airport there. And the Japanese government is always doing this to the Nagoya regional airport. And so when I was talking to uh, Japan Central Railroad and the airline industry about doing something like this, got no support from the Japanese government. I couldn't understand it. Then I found out Japanese government has no stake in the Nagoya airport. They own Haneda, Narita, Kansai. That's all they were interested in. Thank you. 
that was such a, a, a good answer. We're going to move to a soft question, soft power. There With a baseball bat? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, there are a cluster of questions. Uh, one of them asks, uh, quite appropriately, what should the role of Japanese Americans be in improving the bilateral relationship? How specifically, other than the many, many things they already do, is there any special thing? Another one uh, is uh, what, what uh, aspect of soft power uh, does Japan have that could be uh, used to improve bilateral relationships? We now have uh, a prime minister who, who likes manga, and uh, many of our students are studying manga and see this as the, as the way. Is there anything other than you know, ikebana, manga, whatever, uh, that you would recommend. And then finally, uh, a, a, a student says, put yourself in the shoes of an international student, uh, Japanese, in the US, uh, or, or an American student in Japan. How does international study benefit them in pursuit of a career? They got three questions now. Japanese Americans, uh, what soft power does Japan have on the bilateral relationship, and then Think back, I know it's going to be a long memory, about being a student and uh, what... <laughs> that is a long memory. <laughs> uh, to uh, either Japanese... Well, the answer is yes, no, yes. No, thank so, you. <laughs> now, the next question. <laughs> no, you know, it's sort of interesting in terms of the role of the um, Americans of Japanese ancestry, what role can they play? Um, and I served during the Korean War when the war was over, I then got transferred to uh, Camp Zama, the uh, Army Forces Far East, 8th Army Headquarters. I, I don't know how many have served in Japan in that post-World War II era. Any show of hands here? But, uh, you know, in a way, I really felt um, under thumb. You know, a sense that I felt that I was the son they thought of as uh, the son of immigrants who couldn't, Japanese who couldn't cut it in Japan and they had to immigrate to the United States. And, and I really felt this in that period from 54 to 56 when I was there. And I really, frankly, resented it. Um, I think in the last 20 years, the Japanese people themselves have come to realize how tough the Issei's had it when they came over here and how tough the Nisei's had it over the years. And now their attitude is totally different. And there are, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has set aside a, a budget of money to encourage a selection of, I think there are about 15 to 20 young Japanese American professionals who are selected each year to go to Japan for a couple of weeks to get to know things about Japan. And so, you know, all of us as Japanese Americans are proud to be Americans but we're also proud of our Japanese ancestry. And so we ought to be used in some way to build this relationship that I mentioned earlier. And, and this is a real turnabout for us as well, because as a result of evacuation, none of us wanted to have anything to do with Japan. My dad during World War II was teaching Japanese at the University of Chicago under the Army Specialized Training Program. And he'd say, here's the lesson plan. I want you to learn Japanese. I said, man, I don't want anything to do with that. Don't, don't, don't give me any lesson plans on learning Japanese. He said, look, in the privacy of the home, you can do anything you want. And I want you to learn Japanese. And uh, so I ended up taking those lessons as he was doing it at the university. I was doing it at home. Um, and... Uh, so I think we can now. I think there's a recognition in Japan as, a rec as well as a recognition by 
Sansa is in the third and fourth generation to want to do something in terms of promoting uh, U.S.-Japan relationship. Now, in terms of aspect of the soft power that uh, Dr. Hellman was talking about, the Japanese haven't gotten to this point yet of what is citizen participation? What is, you know, I remember when these Japanese companies were coming into San Jose in Silicon Valley. United Way was having a tough time with the Japanese companies. The companies, normal U.S. companies were getting, you know, 70, 80 percent participation in United Way. And uh, the Japanese companies, in terms of participation, very low, 35, 40 percent. And that was because the management at the Japanese companies weren't encouraging their uh, companies or employees to, to be involved in United Way campaigns. And uh, so United Way asked me to help uh, try to do something with the companies. And so now I think um, you'll find uh, the Japanese companies wanting to participate. And uh, so that I think we ought to be able to take advantage of, of Japanese companies in the US doing things like community corporate, I guess you might call it corporate social responsibility, uh, try to get them to take that whole issue of corporate social responsibility back to Japan in order to build, again, from the Japanese perspective, a bridge to the United States through non-government action. Uh, and then from the perspective of the, of the Japanese student who's here or the American student that goes to Japan, You know, in 10, 15 years, as these students who are going to school here and then migrate back to Japan, whether it's in the business sector or the government sector, they're going to be their leaders 10, 15 years from now. And I think this is one of the biggest things that I think we blew back in after the tragedy of 9-11 is that where we had over 350,000 students from around the world coming to the United States, it's now down to something like 120,000. People are going to France, England, Australia, other countries, and they're not coming to the United States. And if you ever want to hear some eloquent testimony was when Secretary uh, uh, of state Colin Powell was uh, complaining about this and especially after the formation of uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, March 1 of 2003 because they took over the whole issue of student visas and and uh, and you know Department of Homeland Security is to keep everybody out and uh, so it just dropped and today it's, as I said it's somewhere around 115, 120,000 students that are now in this country. And we're losing, we're, we're losing in terms of where we will be 10, 15, 20 years from now, because those students aren't coming here. They're going to other countries for their degrees. I don't think it's important that students come here and stay here. I think it is important that, that they get a good education, that they get a good feeling about about what they learned here and about their relationships that they built here and then be able to go back to their home country and either be in the private sector or the public sector and then that uh, again that interchange uh, between the the, the private uh, relationships that exist. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, I agree with you that the testimony of, of Colin Powell on this was, was truly eloquent. But it, it's a source of real frustration because the justification for this is, is found in, of course, uh, Homeland Security and the elaborate process, visa processing, which are, are just 
you know, they're surreal. I mean, that's the only way I, I've had some experience just trying to get professors who went home for uh, a sickness in the family had to wait for, and they wait, had to wait six months before they could get a visa to come back and discharge their teaching responsibilities. Now, this is not just right or wrong, it's silly. And the question is where, you know, what number do you dial? Is this the American government's problem? Uh, or, and if so, as a, as a battle-scarred veteran of both the Congress and the executive branch, which number would you dial? Well, there's no question that it's a 911 that goes to the Department of Homeland Security because they've got the handle, their hand on the throttle and um, their attitude is not how to bring more students in, how to just keep people out. That's right, yeah, right. And uh, it's really a disservice to, uh, to the country and to the international students coming. Right, right, right. You know, for, they require interviews of everybody. But man, when you were in some remote part of China, remote part of India, and they're requiring these kinds of extensive interviews, it is just, it's unreasonable. Right. And uh, there are other ways to be able to um, check on them. And uh, so, um, I just feel that uh, hopefully whoever comes in and uh, gets sworn in on the 20th of January, that this is one of those areas that will be helped. And, and maybe uh, finally, uh, the, this, I will summarize a series of, of hard questions, which uh, I've, I've, I've read them all, but, um, and, and, <laughs> Not, not on you. <laughs> uh, the, these are, are questions that uh, uh, raise doubts about Japan's past history, uh, the legacies of World War uh, II and so forth, uh, that inhibit uh, Japan uh, playing a leading, the kind of international role they ought to play. Um, and, and, and unnecessary, I mean, whether it's the Yasukuni shrine visits or whatever, uh, the, this history is used, clearly used, by the Chinese government and others to, to the detriment of, of Japan's playing a leading role in all of this. The, the question is, you know, and, and our Congress passed a resolution, first in history, uh, uh, condemning uh, the comfort women. And, you know, this is kind of unprecedented. And I think one legacy of the past that it inhibits Japan from playing what its rightful role ought to be is whether fairly or unfairly these kinds of issues are put on the table. And they, and they predictably evoke very strong and negative reactions from the Japanese government, of course. I mean, it, you know, who? You know, who is our Congress to start interfering with there? But nevertheless, the pattern is there, and you're one of the, given your emphasis on people-to-people -people diplomacy, and which I totally, with which I totally agree, as a keystone for moving forward, on a, or not just, you know, can we change Article 9 or whatever. Do you have any thoughts on how both the United States, I might add, because of what we've been doing for the last few years in Iraq and elsewhere, as well as, the, as Japan, uh, we have our own problems of soft power here. And uh, maybe my question is, is, as a kind of a diplomat, private sector, Washington veteran, could you have any final words that will let us go home and sleep <laughs> comfortably tonight? <laughs> well, um, Let me focus on one aspect of this whole thing, um, the issue of the comfort women you brought up. And, and this, I know, sticks in the craw of a lot of people. And um, Congressman Mike Honda, who introduced this resolution, uh, gets vilified by a lot of people, 
as to what was his motive in doing that. And I've heard everything from, oh, he's got, you know, large Chinese population, Korean American population in his constituency. And uh, Mike's a very close friend of mine. And um, we've talked about this a lot. And it's not from anything other than the fact that he was also evacuated as a child with his parents and into camp. And he thinks that a country that can admit a wrong and get it out, gets it out behind them. The United States admitted a wrong in H.R. 442 and said, the Congress on behalf of the American people apologizes to the Japanese American population and we will pay redress of $20,000 per person. Now there's nothing in, the, in Mike's resolution about payment, but he does seek uh, an apology. Now the, I've talked to you, ambassadors from Japan and others about this, and their feeling is, well, Prime Minister XYZ have spoken out on this issue, but their diet, their country has never taken an issue on this matter. My feeling is if they would just go ahead and pass something out of their diet, acknowledging a wrong from the past and acknowledging this, saying we're sorry. And even the, you know, the Japanese government said, well, it wasn't, we didn't do this. These were Japanese companies that, that did these things. But I really think that it, it'll, the whole thing will just blow away in a minute if the Japanese government would take some official action. Yes, prime ministers have spoken out as individuals. Members of, uh, of, um, of the Diet have spoken out as individuals. Cabinet members, etc., others have done that. But the government has never taken any action on this. And uh, so uh, my hope is at some point uh, the government itself will take a, an action and get this matter behind them. In the absence of doing that, it will always be a simmering relationship problem between China and Korea and, the, and Japan. And... Uh, and uh, um, I even think that if something like that were passed, prime ministers can go to Yasukuni Shrine in China and Korea could care less. But uh, as, long as, as long as this is still there, uh, every time they think about going to Yasukuni Shrine, they go, well, uh, you know, and then they'll start going through that uh, chant as well. So my hope is that at some point, the government itself not individuals in the government, but the government itself will take official action to say, hey, we screwed up, we're sorry, and get it out from behind them. Thank you. I, I notice no one is asleep now, but I think you can all thank him and go, allow us to go home and go to sleep. Thank you so much. For thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Secretary Mineta. We'd like to offer you a token of appreciation, and it says, Norman Mineta, 2008 Tateuchi Lecturer, a world of thanks from the Jackson School of International oh, Studies. Terrific. Isn't that beautiful? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, <clears throat> from soft power pitches to hardball questions, Secretary Mineta, hit them all for home runs. So thank you all. And once again, thanks to Ina Goodwin Tatiuchi and her foundation for the generous support they provide us for making sure we have one major lecture every year focusing on international affairs, particularly relating to Japan. Thank you very much, Mrs. Tatiuchi.
Thank you all for coming, and good night.